We will start the recitation by doing problems in section 7.1. The first problem we will solve is 3a and 3c. Indicate whether the statements are true or false. Justify your answer. 3a states that if two elements in the domain of a function are equal, then their images in the codomain are equal. This is true because according to the definition of function, Given any element x in the domain, there is a unique element in the codomain that is related to x. So for any input, there is one and only one output. If two inputs are equal, their outputs must also be equal. Any questions? Statement in 3C is, a function can have the same output for more than one input. This is also true. The definition of function states that no element in the domain is related to more than one element in the codomain. But elements in the codomain can be related to more than one element in the domain. Any questions? Next, we will solve problem 4a. Find all functions from set x to set y. The domain contains elements a, b. The codomain contains elements u, v. There are two cases. One is the elements in X map to different elements in Y. The other is elements in X map to the same elements in Y. So there are four functions from X to Y, and we can draw four arrow diagrams. The first function is when A maps to U and B maps to V. The second function is when A maps to V and B maps to U. The third function is when both A and B map to U. The fourth function is when both A and B map to V. Any questions? Next, we will solve problem 6a. Find functions defined on the set of non-negative integers that define the sequences whose first six terms are given below. The sequence starts with 1, negative 1 over 3, 1 over 5, and it goes on. By observing the first few terms of this sequence, we can see that the numerators are just, uh, are just alternating 1 and negative 1s. The denominators are 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, which are odd numbers. We can write them as 2n plus 1. So the rule can be written as negative 1 to the nth power over 2n plus 1 n should start at 0, and it goes down to be 1, 2, 3, 4, so the domain is all non-negative integers. Since the sequence contains fractions, the codomain are real numbers. In the end, we can say that the sequence is given by the function f maps non-negative integers to real numbers, defined by the rule f of n is equal to negative 1 to the nth power over 2n plus 1. Uh, I hear a question. So, uh, did the second question include the ones that are not on two, or we don't have to include them? Um, uh, which problem is this? Include the ones that are not on to, or we don't have to include them. Hmm. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, basically, there are uh, two that are not on to here. But yes, it basically says find all the functions. That means on to or not on to. So you think you're right. These are the uh, four possible functions. A and B are both mapped to U. A is mapped to U. B is mapped to V. A is mapped to V. U. B is mapped to U and A and B are both mapped to V. 
and we can see that uh, the last one and the first one or the ones that are on the right hand side are not onto functions because they uh, either v or u don't have no are not the mapping of uh, a or b so yes the, the answer is that finding all the functions means both onto functions and not onto functions yeah thank you welcome so we finish this one next we will solve 7a and 7c let a equals to the set containing 1 2 3 4 5 and define a function f that maps the power set of a to integers as follows for all sets x in the power set of A, fx equals to 0 if x has an even number of elements, and fx equals to 1 if x has an odd number of elements. We need to find f of set 1, 3, 4, and f of set 2, 3. Both sets are in the power set of A. For part A, f of set 1, 3, 4 is equal to 1 because there are three elements in the set 1, 3, 4 and 3 is an odd number. Similarly, for part B, f of set 2, 3 is equal to 0 because there are two elements in the set 2, 3, and 2 is an even number. Any questions? Next, we will do 8a and 8b. Let j5 equal to a set containing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and define a function f that maps j5 to j5 as follows. For each element x in j5, fx is equal to the sum of x cubed and 2x and 4 mod 5. We need to find f of 0 and f of 1. For f0, we can substitute x in this equation with 0. So f0 equals the sum of 0 cubed plus 2 times 0 plus 4 mod 5, which is 4 mod 5, and the result is 4. For f1, we substitute x in the equation with 1. So f1 equals the sum of 1 cubed plus 2 times 1 plus 4 mod 5, which is 7 mod 5, and the result is 2. Any questions? Next, we will do problem 9a to 9c. Define a function s that maps positive integers to positive integers as follows. For each positive integer n, s, n, s of n is equal to the sum of positive divisors of n. We need to find s1, s15, and s17. 1 has only one positive divisor, which is itself. So s of 1 equals 1. 15 is equal to 1 times 15 and 3 times 5. So it has four positive divisors. s of 15 is 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 15 equals 24. 17 is a prime number. It has two positive divisors, which are 1 and itself. So s of 17 is 1 plus 17 equals 18. Any questions? Next, we will solve problem 11a and 11b. Define f on Cart Cartesian product with integers and integers as follows. For all ordered pairs a, b of integers, f of tuple a, b is equal to tuple 2a plus 1, 3b minus as two. We need to find f of 4, 4 and f of 2, 1. We can just plug the tuples in for the equation. f of 4, 4 is equal to 2 times 4 plus 1 and 3 times 4 minus 2. So the result is tuple 9, 10. And f of 2, 1 is equal to 2, ti 2 times 2 plus 1 and 3 times 1 minus 2. So the result is tuple 5, 1. Any questions? Next, we will solve problem 19. Use the definition of logarithm to prove that for any positive real number b with b, 
not equal to one, the logarithm with base b of b is one. The proof is very straightforward. According to the definition of logarithm, the logarithm with base b of b is the exponent to which b must be raised to obtain b, and that exponent is one. So we can say, let b be any positive real number with b not equal to one. Since b to the first power is b, by definition of logarithm, the log with base b of b is one. Any questions? Next, we will solve problem 23. If b and y are positive real numbers, such that the logarithm with base b of y is three, what is the logarithm with base 1 over b of y? First, we suppose b and y are positive real numbers with logarithm with base b of y is 3. By definition of logarithm, this implies that b cubed is equal to y. Then y equals to b cubed, and it equals to its reciprocal of reciprocal and it equals to 1 over the cube of uh, 1 over b, which is equal to 1 over b to the negative 3th power. Thus, by definition of logarithm, log with space 1 over b of y is equal to negative 3. Any questions? Next, we will solve problem 27. Student A tries to define a function g maps to q to c by the rule g of m over n is equal to m minus n for all integers m and n and with n not equal to zero. Student B claims that g is not well defined, justifies student B's claim. We say that a function is not well defined if it fails to satisfy at least one of the requirements for being a function. Here we can show that for function g, the same element in the domain maps to more than one element in the codomain. So if g were well defined, then g of one half is equal to g of two over four, because one half is equal to two over four. However, g of one half is equal to one minus two, which is negative one. And g of 2 over 4 is equal to 2 minus 4, which is negative 2. Since negative 1 is not equal to negative 2, g of 1 half is not equal to g of 2 over 4. Since the same element in the domain maps to more than one element in the codomain, g is not well defined. Any questions? That's all for section 7.1. Thank you. Thank you, Yunting. Vasuda, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. So please share your screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So now we'll be solving questions from uh, section 7.2. The first question that we'll be solving is number four. Let f x to y be a function. True or false? A sufficient condition for f to be one one is that for all elements y in y, there is at most one x in x with fx is equal to y. So this would be um, true because for all elements y in y there is at most x which means that there is an um, for any element there's either no image in x or there is just one and not more than that so this would mean that um, our function is definitely going to be one to one any questions okay so the next question that we'll be solving is number nine let x is uh, 1, 2, 3, y, 1, 2, 3, 4, and z, 1, 2. A, define a function f from x to y that is 1 to 1, but not onto. So um, from x to y. So 
So when um, it's not on to, it means that there would be uh, some element in Y such that it does not have an, uh, in, have an image in X. So we could easily define a F as um, an identity function because we have one, two, and three in Y, but four is not present, so it wouldn't be on two. For B, define a function g from x to z that is on two but not one to one. So in this case, um, we could uh, we need all of the all of the elements in z to have an image, at least one image in x, but uh, which would mean that any two of the elements in x need not be mapped to different um, different uh, elements in the codomain Z. So in this case, we could just define it as f of 1 equal to 1 f of 2 also gives you 1 and f of 3 is 2. So this this would give you a function that is on 2 but not 1 to 1. But you could also use a different combination. You could make this two and this one, and it will still work. Any questions so far? OK. Define a function h. Sorry, this two is g. Define a function h that is neither one to one nor on two. So this means that um, any two elements in x could be uh, map to the same element again to x and not all the elements in x should have a um, should have an image back in x so i think this will be easy to define if you just did something like this in this case all of the elements get mapped to one which means it's neither one to one nor on two any questions so far D, define a function k from x to x that is one to one and on to, but is not the identity function on x. So um, all I mean, this was a function that was both um, for from x to x that would give you one to one and on to, but um, since we should not be defining the identity function, we could define it as something like this. And this will give you a function that's not uh, identity function. Sorry, I think this has to be defined with a k. But at the same time, it is both one to one because none of the not, no two elements will map to the same uh, uh, to the same uh, element in the codomain, and uh, also all of the um, all of the elements in the codomain have an image. So, is it clear so far? The next question that we'll be doing is number 11. A, define g from z to z by the rule g of n um, is equal to 4n minus phi for all integers n. Is g one to one? Prove or give a counterexample. So um, to know if it is one to one, we could assume that there are uh, two numbers, n1 and n2, in Z, so uh, they would be mapping. The mapping would look like four n one minus five, and g of n two would be four n two minus five. So um, for this to be one to uh, one, we um, we need to prove that if these two were to be equal then it's only possible when n1 and n2 are themselves equal. So we equate these two. And in turn, we get n1 equal to n2. So this means that a function is 1 to 1. Is g on to prove or give a counterexample? So um, 
how um so if you have any uh, function if you have any um if, uh, any element in the code domain that is for g of n um it would look like let's, let's just write down the function again now in this case we could um when we have a given a given in uh, given function as g of n then the corresponding image is going to look like g of n plus five plus four that would give you n so this is what our uh, image is going to look like now this function note that this function is from integers to integers so we could only say this is on to this will be exactly mapping to an integer and all of the integers will um, have an image this way but we find that this is only going to be mapped to an integer if this bar was going to be a multiple of four because we are doing a division by four so we could easily provide a counter example for this like say if g of n were equal were to be equal to so you can, which is also an integer. Now this would not have an image in Z because then we'll be ending up with N is equal to uh, 10 plus five divided by four, which is 15 by four, which does not belong to Z. So, this is not on to. Define uh, the B part of the question. Define G from R to R by the rule G of X is equal to 4X minus 5 for all real numbers X. Is G on to? True or give a counterexample? Now, this is very straightforward because we've already worked out for the part two of the previous part. We know that this is. This is what the image is going to look like. Now we know that for any any this is going from real numbers to real numbers, unlike the previous part where it went from integers, which is why it was not uh, on to. But in this case, it is going to be um, on to. Is it clear so far? The next question that we'll be doing is number fourteen. Explain the mistake in the following proof. Here, the function f from z to z defined by the formula f of n is equal to 4n plus 3 for all integers n is 1 to 1. Proof. Suppose any integer n is given, then the definition of f, there's only one possible value for f of n, namely 4n plus 3. Hence, f is one to one so this is a wrong wrong uh, way of proving it because we are only taking the definition of f itself which means that there's only one possible value for fn but that's not how one to one functions are defined to prove that it's a one to one function we need to prove that for any two um, values of n if they were to be map to the same value for uh, n plus 3 f of n then we need to prove that both n1 and n2 are going to be equal to each other and there's only a unique uh, way to uh, map back from uh, an element in the codomain so this is not the right way to do it the mistake in the proof is that um, one to one Is it clear so far? Okay, next question that we'll be doing is number 21. 
let d be the set of all finite subsets of positive integers and define t from z plus to d by the rule for all integers n t of n is the set of all the positive divisors of n is t one to one prove or give a counter example so um is t one to one what this means is that given a certain uh set of positive divisors is it um is there only one way to map back to is there only one way to map back to the set of positive integers yes uh, there's only one way because we know that all of the uh, positive integers have a unique factorization and there'll only be a unique set of combinations of all of these such that um, you have a certain number back in the uh, positive integers so uh, yes it is one to one but is it on to is it uh, we know that for all uh, the mapping goes from z plus to d the thing is uh, for this could be any set of devices and we know that for any positive integer one is always going to be uh, a divisor of any positive integer now if we were to have a set that does not have one in it which would this is a finite all finite subsets of positive integers so this would also include something like two three let's say this is just one counter example this is not mapping for any positive integer so this means that there is no image for this specific subset back in z plus because all of them will have to have one one as one of the one of the elements in the um, in their uh, codeming so this is not a valid mapping so this means that this is not on to is it uh, okay so far any questions next we'll be doing number 25 define f from z plus cross z plus to z plus and g z plus cross z plus to z plus as follows for all nm that belongs to z plus cross z plus f of n comma m gives you 3 power n 5 power m and g n m gives 3 power n 6 power n is f 1 to 1 prove or give a counter example but to prove that f is one to one we assume um, two sets of values because this is like a tuple so we we're assuming um n1 n2 m1 and m2 belong to z z plus so this uh, f of n1 comma m1 would be mapped to e to the power n1 times phi to the power m1 and uh, you have a similar mapping for m2 and m2 m2 and m2 now we need to prove that if these these two were to be equal then n1 m1 have to be equal to n2 m2 so let's do that we could do this because this is a prime factorization unique prime factorization we know that this if both of them were to be equal then the only possible way for this to happen if is if each of their powers were equal so by equating the powers we will have to get n1 equals n2 and m1 equals n2 
So yes, there is one to one. Is G one to one true or give a counter example? It's similar, except that in this case, in this case, we do not have a five, and five is supposed to be a, a prime, so it makes our steps a little easier. But in this case, we'll have to uh, do a little extra work. We do. Uh, 6 is equal to 2 times 3. And so that will give you um, an extra factor of 2. Is it OK so far? Now again, we try to equate the factors because now we have come up with the prime factors and we could again use the unique factorization theorem to say that um, M1 is equal to M2 and N1 plus M1 is equal to N2 plus N2. But we already know that M1, uh, sorry, M1 and M2 are going to be equal. So this means that n1 has to be equal to n2 to so yes it is one to one any questions okay the next we'll be doing 26a is log to the base 8 27 equal to log to the base 2 3 why or why not so let's assume that log to the base 8 of 27 is equal to some r. And we get 8 to the power 8 r is equal to 27. And we know that. Um, 8 is equal to 2 cubed, 27 is equal to 3 cubed. Now, by substituting it into this, we get 2 cubed whole to the power r gives you 3 cubed. Two to the power three r is to three cube. Now we could take both the um, both L, uh, the right hand side and the uh, left hand side to the uh, power one by three. Two to the power three r over to the power one by three equal to 3 to the power 3 over to the power 1 by 3. Now we end up with 2 to the power r is u3. Now this could be also written as r is equal to log to the base 2. Now, uh, from this and this, we get that they're both equal. So we get log to the base 8, 27 is equal to log to the base 2, 3. We have proved it. Any questions? Okay. Next, we're going to be doing number 29. Prove that for all real numbers a, b, and x, with b and x positive and b is not equal to 1, uh, log b 
uh, of log to the base b of x power a is equal to a log to the base b of x. We prove this in a similar way to the previous one. So log to the base b x power a is r. Now we could write x to the power a as b to the power r. Now x could be like x to the power a whole to the power one by a will give you b to the power r whole to the power one by a. So x is equal to b to the power r by a. Now the second part that is a log to the power uh, log to the base b of x. Let's assume this is equal to s. Now um, we could uh, shift a to the other side and write this as log to the base b. I'll just draw a line here to avoid some confusion. Any questions so far? So we could write uh, this as s equals b to the power s by a. Now we equate these two. b to the power r by a is equal to b to the power s by a. This gives you r by a is equal to s by a. And so you get r is equal to s. So we prove that r is equal to s. And so we proved it. Any questions? OK, so the final problem that we'll be doing from 7.2 is question number 34. Suppose f from x to y is 1 to 1. A, prove that for all subsets A, subset of x, f inverse of f of A is A. So for this, uh, we use some concepts from the set theory to do this. So we have, let's assume that we have um, f of r for some element r belongs to f of a. Now, by uh, because uh, f of r is going to be having some image in a, we know that there has to be some um, some element x in a such that f of x is going to be f of r. Since we know and we've been told that this is one to one, f is one to one. So x is equal to r. And so we, uh, we have finished the first part of the proof where we say that f inverse of f of a will, um, is a subset of a. Now, uh, we know that to prove equality of um, sets, we also have to prove it the other way. So the second part, we have to prove that a is a subset of a, f inverse of f of a. So we assume we assume x belongs to a. Now, um, f of x, f belongs to a. It could be any element. Now, f of x is going to um, 
belong to f of a. And since um, f is going to be one to one, it's going to be a subset of f inverse of f of a. So a is a subset of f inverse of f of a. So we have proved that um, f inverse of f of a is the same as a. Any questions? Okay. So the b part of the sorry. Yeah. Yeah. For thirty four. Um, can you explain why exactly do you prove that uh, f of r belong to f of a? Could you repeat that? Uh, yeah. So the first, can you uh, repeat the first part of the proof where f of r belong to f of a, that part? Can you explain that a little bit more? I don't okay. quite understand that. Yeah. So um, f of r, we are just assuming that for some, um, we are just assuming that there's going to be some element that, that's mapped to, um, that's being mapped to um, f of a. So it's not like r, r is an element from x. So it need not, not necessarily, a. a is just a subset of x. So given f of r belongs to f of a, because f is one to one, it's uh, we could just easily say that x is going to be a part of, um, sorry, x is going to be equal to r. And so we can prove that this r has to be from a and not from anywhere else. It has to be in the subset a. Does that make sense? So R is from an element of X, right? But uh, A is only a subset of X, not yes. every in X yeah. is in A. Yeah. Uh, let me but but because F is one to one, X if for any element in A, F X has to be equal to R, and that's how uh, the definition of the function is. So since it's one to one, it has to be equal, and so for any r, it has to be from a. Oh, I think I see. Uh, r is, yeah, I see. I think I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um, b part of the question is similar. Prove that for all subsets a one and a two in X, f or um, f a one in Section A2 is equal to FA1 intersection FA2. So um, F of A1 intersection A2, so let's assume we have some element U um, belongs to A1 intersection A2. So um, F of U is going to belong to F of A1 and U also belongs to A1 separately and U belongs a2. And since uh, for any, this is for any generic u, if but since u belongs to a1 and u belongs to a2, f of u will belong to f of a1. And f of u will belong to f of a2. 
and so we could say that um, f of u belongs to f of a1 intersect f of a2. So f of a1 intersect a2 is a subset of this. That's the first part. Second part. Yeah, the second part is to prove that if we had an element belonging to this, that has to be a part of f of a1 intersection a2. So we assume that we have uh, some v. And since this is in the codomain, we could just say um, f of v belongs to f of belongs to f of a1 intersect f of a2. So f of v would belong to f of a1 and f of v would also belong to f of a2. So we again use the uh, same argument as we used in the last problem. So there has to be some element um, in um, in in the image such that we have for, we have that it's going to be belong uh, it's going to be f of r equals f of v. So for some Now, x is going to be equal to v because f is one to one. So, um, because of this, um, x has to belong to both the f of x. And so we prove that any uh, anything that belongs to f of a1 intersect f of a2 is uh, is a subset of um, f of a1 intersect a2. So we have proved that they're both equal. Is clear? Any questions? And that's the end of 7.2. Thank you very much, Pasuda. Yeah. So you can start presenting. Palak? Yeah, I'll share my screen. Thank you. Can you see it? Yes. OK, uh, so I'm doing exercise 7.3, and I'll be doing these questions on top. Thank you. The first question is the first one. Uh, so th these are the functions, and we have to find g of f and f of g, and determine whether g of f is equal to f of g. So you can find g of f by uh, this method. So g of f of 1 is equal to g of f of 1 
And here you can see that f of 1 is equal to 5. So you have to find g of 5. And here g of 5 is equal to 1. So g of f of 1 is equal to 1. Similarly, uh, you can do it for all uh, g of f of 3 and g of f of 5. And f of g is similar. So f of g of 1 is equal to f of g of 1 in brackets. And now g of 1 is equal to 3. So you have to find f of 3. And now f of 3 is equal to 3 as well. So f of g of 1 is equal to 3. So yeah, similarly, you can find 1, 3, and 5. And we have to determine whether g of f is equal to f of g. And this is not, because you can see that g of f of 1 is not equal to f of g of 1, because the values are 1 and 3, respectively. Any questions? OK. Uh, I'll be doing the third question next. So this is kind of similar. So here, f of x is equal to x cubed, and g of x is equal to x minus 1 for all real numbers x. And we have to find g of f and f of g, and again, determine whether they're equal. So you can see that g of f of x is equal to g of f of x in brackets. Now f of x is x cube, so you have to find g of x cube, which is equal to, you substitute the value of x in g of x. So you get x cube minus 1 for all real numbers x. And f of g of x is equal to f of g of x in brackets. So g of x is x minus 1, so you have to find f of x minus 1. Now f of x is x cube, so you substitute the value x minus 1 in f of x and you get x minus 1 whole cube for all real numbers x. And you can see that x cube minus 1 is not equal to x minus 1 cube, the whole cube in all cases. And the, this is an example. So g of f of 2 is equal to 7, and f of g of 2 is equal to 1. So these are not equal. Uh, next is the fifth question. So. You have to uh, f is defined as r to r by the rule f of x is equal to minus x for all real numbers x. So we have to find f of f of x. Now f of f of x is equal to f of f of x in brackets. And since f of x is equal to minus x, you substitute that value. So you get f of minus x. And now f of minus x is equal to minus of minus x which is equal to x for all real numbers x. Any questions? OK. Uh, the next is the sixth question. Now, f and g are defined by the rules f of a is equal to 7a, and g of a is equal to a mod 5 for all integers a. So we have to find g of f of 0, g of f of 1, g of f of 2, g of f of 3, and g of f of 4. So g of f of 0 is equal to g of f of 0 in brackets. Now, uh, f of 0 is 7 into 0 because f of a is 7a. So that means uh, you have to find g of 0, which is 0 mod 5, which is 0. Now, g of f of 1 is equal to g of f of 1 in brackets. And f of 1 is 7a, so g you have to find g of 7 into 1, which is g of 7. This is 7 mod 5, which is equal to 2. Uh, similarly, you can find it for 2, 3, and 4 as well. It's the same process. So you get the answers as 4, 1, and 3, respectively. Uh, the next question is 8a. Um, L and M functions are defined by the rules L of A is equal to A squared and M of, M of A is equal to A mod 5 for all integers A. So here we have to find L of M of 12, M of L of 12, L of M of 9, and M of L of 9. So you can see that L of M of 12 is equal to L of M of 12 in brackets. M of 12 is 12 mod 5, so you have to find L of 12 mod 5 which is 2. So L of 2 is equal to 2 square, which is equal to 4. And M of L of 12 is equal to M of L of 12 in brackets, which is M of 12 squared, because L of A is A squared. 
this is m of 144 and 144 mod 5 is equal to 4. So you can see that in this case, l of m of 12 and m of l of 12 is equal. But the following says that it's not always equal because l of m of 9, which is 16, is not equal to m of l of 9, which is 1. Any questions? OK. Uh, the ninth question. So. The functions of each pair in nine are inverse to each other. For each pair, check that both compositions give the identity function. F goes from R to R, and F inverse goes to R to R are defined by F of X is equal to three plus two, three X plus two, and F of Y is equal to Y minus two by three for all Y belongs to R. So we can, so here you have to check that both the compositions give the identity function. So now you have to do f inverse of f of x. So f inverse of x of f of x will give you f of uh, f inverse of three x plus two because f of x is three x plus two. And now you substitute three x plus two in the y value, so you get three x plus two minus two divided by three. This is three x by three, which is x, which is the identity function for all x and r. So f inverse of f is equal to the identity function by the definition of equality of functions. Just a second, this is supposed to be, yeah. Now f of f inverse of y. So f of f inverse of y will give you f of y minus two by three. Now you substitute y minus two by three and three x plus two and you get three into y minus two by three plus two, which is y. And this is the identity function for all y and r. So basically f inverse of f is also an identity function and f of f inverse is also an identity function by the definition. The next question is 12a. So explain how it follows from the definition of logarithm that log to the base b and b of x is equal to x for all real numbers x. So by the definition of log, you can say that anything to the, like when it's, um, when it's to a base, which is equal to the number that you have to find the log of, you get the number, which is the power of that. So suppose we had to, um suppose you had to get bx this would be b power b power x and that that would make you get bx but here it's just bx so you get log to the base b of bx is equal to x any questions okay uh the 15th question so suppose y and z are sets and g is y to z is a one-to-one -one function. This means that if g takes the same value on any two elements of y, then those two elements are equal. Thus, for example, if a and b are elements of y and g of a is equal to g of b, it can be inferred that a is equal to b. What can be inferred from the following situations? So a, b, and c are given. a says that sk and sm are elements of y and g. sk is equal to g of sm. So from this, we can conclude that sk is equal to sm because it says that in the function that if uh, a and b are elements of y and g of a is equal to g of b, then a is equal to b. So similarly, uh, z by 2 and t by 2 are also elements of y and the functions are equal. So you can say that z by 2 is equal to t by 2 and f of x1 and f of x2 are also equal because g of f of x1 and is equal to g of f of x2 and both are elements of y. The next is the 17th question. So if uh, f and g are defined as x goes to y and y goes to z respectively, uh, it's given that g of f is on to, is f also on to? We have to prove or give a counterexample. This is false. Uh, and this is the counterexample. So if x, the set x consists of one, and the set y has a and b, and the set z has c, so suppose f of 1 is equal to a, and g of a is equal to c, and g of b is also equal to c. You can see that g of f of 1 is equal to c, 
and G of F is on two because Z contains only C. So every element in C has a value in Y, but F is not on two because uh, F of one is not equal to B. And B doesn't have any value in X, so it's not on two. It's easy to see with an arrow diagram, but uh, uh, do you want I, to draw I, can, I can draw it now if you want. No, no, it's uh, students can do it themselves. It's okay. easier to do it on paper and pen. Okay, yeah. With paper and pen. Continue with 21. Okay. Uh, so the 21st question is true or false. Uh, given any set X and given any functions F, G, and H, where where x goes to x maps x maps to x now h of h is one to one and h of f is equal to h of g then f is equal to g uh justify your answer so this is true we can prove this by uh so for all x in x uh f of x is equal to g of x yeah we have to show this so suppose x is any element in x we know that uh, h of f is equal to h of g because it's given. So you can say that h of f of x is equal to h of g of x. And you by this, you can say that h of f of x in brackets is equal to h of g of x in brackets. But now we also know that h is one to one. So that means that f of x is equal to g of x. So yeah. It's proved. We had to prove that f is equal to g. So this proof, and this is the last question. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen then. Thank you, Palak. Okay, so then that's all, and uh, see you on Thursday uh, for the midterm exam. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you, Scott. Bye, everyone.